Ordinarily, the WWE house show experience is one of mindless fun. A touring troupe of wrestlers mostly going through the motions with the same opponent they've been working with week in and week out, still managing to entertain thousands of fans before jetting off to the next town and wrestling largely the same match all over again. For wrestlers, it's just one blurred match of many, and for fans of all ages, it's a fairly special chance to see the stars up close. With the exception of the odd title change every blue moon, WWE's live events tend to be little more than cookie cutter products, but you know, it's all good fun. But not all house shows are created equal. One time, during the golden era of the then WWF, unforeseen circumstances led to one of the more surreal live events in the promotion's history. I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is the story of the strangest WWE house show. It's October of 1989, and the World Wrestling Federation is closing out on a prosperous decade in which Vince McMahon's sports entertainment empire sits unchallenged atop the industry. At the time, the WWF was so immense that they had enough manpower to sometimes run three different touring loops simultaneously. Generally speaking, there would be a seven or eight match A show in a major North American city headlined by a Hulk Hogan title defense or a heated grudge match. Then you had the B show in a comparable or smaller city with a reasonably good lineup of seven or eight matches. And then on occasion, there'd be the C show in a smaller town featuring five or six matches topped by a decent headline attraction. Sometimes there'd even be those dreaded weekend double shots where wrestlers would perform at two events in a day, a matinee and then a nighttime showing in a city several hours away. The WWF ran over 60 events in October 1989 and seeing as there are only 31 days in October, that should give you an idea of just how busy this roster was. Lots of travel and lots of ground covered. Looking back at WWF's model of touring through the years, it's amazing just how smoothly things ran from not just a logistical standpoint, but a fortunate one as well. For the most part, things seem to run from event to event like clockwork. Here's a glaring example of one time where it didn't work out that way. On Friday, October 27th, the WWF ran three shows with three different crews. One crew hit up Auburn Hills, Michigan, one worked Syracuse, New York, and the other was in St. Cloud, Minnesota. For the next day, the St. Cloud talents would head to Sioux City, Iowa, while... Okay, try to bear with me here. Now, most of the Syracuse crew was headed to Glens Falls, New York, for a 1pm matinee card on that Saturday. However, six different wrestlers who worked that Syracuse show were headed to Springfield, Massachusetts for a different 1pm Saturday matinee show, and they included Randy Savage, Jim Duggan, the Bushwhackers, and the Powers of Pain. Meanwhile, those who wrestled in Auburn Hills that Friday night were flying in earlier Saturday, and most of them, including Bret Hart, Mr. Perfect, The Ultimate Warrior, and others, were headed to the Springfield show. Others, like Roddy Piper, Rick Rude, and Demolition, were bound for Glens Falls. Most of the crew from those two matinees then had to travel to New York's Madison Square Garden that Saturday night for an exclusive MSG Network card. Okay, so the next time you think your job's hard, remember, you never had to work in WWE's travel department. Now, for this particular story, we're going to be focusing on that card in Springfield, Mass. The Springfield Civic Center was clearly a staple among WWF's deep cache of venues, as the building housed seven separate Federation events in 1989 alone, including a TV taping shortly after SummerSlam. Most events in the building drew between 5,000 and 7,000 patrons, so it was certainly no sea town. And based on the matches from surrounding events of the day, there appear to have been seven intended matches for the Springfield card. The planned main event was to pit Savage against Duggan. The two had been feuding since just after SummerSlam when Savage defeated Hacksaw to win the unofficial King Championship, netting Savage the crown jewels that turned him from Macho Man into Macho King. Also in singles action, Bret Hart would have squared off with veteran heel Dino Bravo. The Hitman was still one half of the Hart Foundation with Jim Neidhart, but the two were often separated in this period for singles matches because Bret was being prepped for a true singles run that he'd been promised since the previous year. Mr. Perfect was a talent comparable to Hart, and he was set for action on this show, working with the aging Superfly Jimmy Snooker. It was your classic case of the younger guy being on his way up, with the star of an earlier time being used to put him over. 
The Bushwhackers and the Powers of Pain were mentioned earlier as being on the same touring loop, and they were in fact opponents for this run of events. Chain-wielding strongman Hercules was to go one-on-one -on -one with Akeem, while underneath wrestler Tim Horner, formerly a mid-card star in the Crockett and Watts territories, squared off with Nikolai Volkov. IC champion The Ultimate Warrior was also scheduled for Springfield, but his intended match isn't exactly clear. While he defeated Andre the Giant the day before in Auburn Hills and went on to wrestle him that night in the Garden, it's perhaps unlikely that an aging, deteriorating Andre would have wrestled twice in the same day, even if both of those matches were kept short, but we just don't know. But we will come back to that Andre situation in a little bit. All of the aforementioned matches, except for Horner vs Volkov, were also scheduled for that night's show in New York, but they just had to get through this afternoon exhibition in Springfield first, and that sounds easy enough, right? But hey, we here at Cultaholic have made a video about it, so, you know, it clearly wasn't that easy. So, what on earth happened? Well, Savage, Duggan, The Bushwhackers, Warlord, and Barbarian all got in easily enough from Friday's card in Syracuse, but everybody else that was booked had worked the Auburn Hills show. And they were flying out of Detroit with the intention of getting to Springfield, one assumes, by late morning, at the very worst. In the end, for whatever reason, the flight from Detroit was not scheduled to land until 1.50pm Eastern Time. Now, the problem here is that the matinee was set to begin at 1pm. That's a bit of a hang-up for, you know, most of the wrestlers that are working this particular card. If they're unable to attend, then you're left with six name-value wrestlers and maybe a few locals on standby. That does not really make a WWF house show, particularly for an audience in Springfield accustomed to higher expectations. It's not clear exactly what happened here, if there was maybe a flight delay or perhaps an error made in the travel arrangements, but whatever the case, the ETA was 50 minutes after the advertised bell time. So the folks running the event did what they had to do under the unusual circumstances. They pushed back the start of the show by at least an hour. This would theoretically allow for the wrestlers on that plane to get transported to the Civic Center in timely enough fashion that they could perhaps begin the event with the already present wrestlers setting the stage for the late arrivals to eventually have their matches further on in the show. It's making the best of a bad situation, but it absolutely had to suck to be in the crowd that afternoon. Imagine buying your concessions, your program, your young stallion's novelty foam finger that you've been saving all of your allowance money for, and then it's the case of this. Oh, by the way, sorry everyone, we're going to be delayed for more than an hour because unfortunately most of the wrestlers aren't flying on a Lockheed Blackbird, the fastest aircraft in the world. So yeah, sorry folks, you're going to be sitting there for a while. Hopefully you can get some mileage out of that little foam finger. Anyway, finally, after 2pm, the event kicked off. Though Savage vs Duggan was the intended main event, the two were sent out first, which was arguably for the best given their star power. Hey, if you were in the crowd for that mind-numbing delay, you wouldn't want to be greeted by two curtain jerkers either. Send out the former WWF champion and his popular nemesis, Pronto. But there may have been another reason for sending Duggan and Savage out first. The inbound group from Detroit may have had a little more difficult time getting to the building, even with the announced pushback. This can be theorized because Duggan and Savage went out there and wrestled for 23 minutes in a match that included the referee playing dead for a full five minutes following a bump. Outside of the Revival's matches with Robert Roode and Chad Gable at house shows in 2019, and Bret Hart's Iron Man matches with Ric Flair and his own brother Owen in the 90s, how many house shows have matches which reach 23 minutes, especially opening matches? There was some pretty clear stalling going on here, not that that's necessarily a bad thing. Savage is a pro, Duggan had some good matches with him, and as long as the crowd wasn't burned out by the extended lull, they're probably chomping at the bit to get invested in all these theatrics. Savage won this really extended opener after belting Duggan with Sensational Sherry's purse, and after that 23 minute outing, it was on to the next match. Another 20 plus minute match, that is. And not just any 20 minute match. No, it was 20 minutes of the Bushwhackers versus the Powers of Pain. Maybe the in-flight movie was just really gripping or something, I don't know. No disrespect to either team, but the four men involved aren't exactly the first names you think of when you imagine a 20 minute thriller. To make matters worse, the extended match gave no closure as the Bushwhackers won via DQ. All of that for a DQ finish. Oh well, on to the next match. Just kidding, it's time for a 20 minute intermission. The fans needed a break at this point after chanting fight forever at Luke and the Warlord after all. When everybody returned to their seats, it was time to begin the mother of all barn burners, something that everybody could finally sink their teeth into. Yes, that's right, it was time for Nikolai Volkov and Jose Luis Rivera to battle to a 20 minute draw. 
Apparently, Volkov skipped the flight and was overnighted via UPS Air into Springfield, Mass, because the seldom-used 42-year-old was going to a Broadway finish with an unmasked member of the Conquistadors. Now, technically, this made it the shortest match of the night by about 10 seconds, despite, you know, going to a time limit draw. Don't think about that for more than eight seconds or blood will start pouring out of your eye sockets. Finally, the other names began arriving. Mr. Perfect defeated Snooker in a comparatively lightning fast 17 minute battle stretched out by Perfect stalling in cowardly heel fashion, of course. So to this point, just to recap, it's gone an hour plus delay, a 23 minute match where the heel wins, a 20 minute tag team match between slower moving heavyweights that ends in a DQ, a 20 minute intermission, a 20 minute draw featuring two hardly canonical talents, and then a 17 minute match with stalling. If all of that wasn't weird enough, this next match really puts it over the top. Bret Hart went on fifth, but instead of working with Dino Bravo as had been the plan, he was situated with Tim Horner, the aforementioned underneath babyface. This is where things deviate a bit from the regular cards. Volkov, who was Horner's regular opponent, instead worked with Rivera. Andre didn't work this show, supporting the idea that he wasn't gonna wrestle twice in a day, or perhaps they just weren't gonna run him ragged on the heels of a late arrival. So Dino Bravo was moved up to the match with Warrior instead. But still, Bret Hart versus Tim Horner. That's a really random match by any measure. Today, this would be like matching up maybe someone like Kofi Kingston, an, an upper mid, a very beloved babyface, against fellow babyface, but lower down, Umberto Carrillo, as the fifth match of an already confusing, soul eradicating live event. But, I mean, it is what it is, isn't it? But then the match itself got weird. In what was certainly the shortest match to this point, the bout ended on a no contest after Horner collapsed in apparent pain after four minutes following an ugly collision on a mistimed leapfrog. According to Horner in a later interview, he was trying to get fired from the company at that point in order to go back to the NWA. What a trooper. By his account, when Vince tried holding him to the terms of his contract, Horner stopped playing ball and in essence stopped doing jobs in an attempt to get canned. The night before in Auburn Hills, Horner was apparently supposed to lose to Volkov, only to instead win via inside cradle. Apparently Volkov didn't care either way. Horner alleges that this errant leapfrog spot with Brett and the subsequent non-finish was concocted before the match as another way for him to be insubordinate towards his employers. Combined with refusing to take a drugs test that day and refusing to lose to the Brooklyn Brawler that night in New York, in Madison Square Garden, the Brooklyn Brawler, Horner found his way out of the company. From there, the rest of the disheveled card went off normally. Hercules pinned Akeem and Warrior defeated Dino Bravo via countout, but in matches of expected length. This brought an end to arguably the weirdest house show ever run by McMahon's organization. Of course, the day wasn't done for this crew, as once the talents finished their matches, they were whisked away 140 miles south to New York for that night's half of the double shot. In fairness, instead of having to drive, it's likely that the wrestlers traveled from Springfield to New York via a rotating series of King Air flights that WWF had commissioned for their own use whenever wrestlers were booked for day and night doubleheaders. Four of the Springfield matches took place again for the benefit of the New York crowd later that same day, albeit with shorter durations than those that had occurred that afternoon. Hercules toppled Akeem, the Bushwhackers once more squeaked by the powers of pain via DQ, Mr. Perfect outlasted Jimmy Snooker, and Savage defeated Duggan following the expected shenanigans. Meanwhile, Hart and Bravo rekindled their road rivalry going for a 20 minute draw together. The obstinate outbound Horner never made it to his match with the Brooklyn Brawler, getting replaced by Rivera, who actually worked twice, wrestling earlier in the night in his Conquistador outfit in a loss to Al Perez. Warrior clashed with Andre, defeating the eighth wonder of the world in a matter of seconds in deference to Andre's declining state. Now that, very interestingly, ended up being Andre's only ever pinfall loss in MSG. The weekend rolled on with much of the same card flying all the way up to Toronto's Maple Leaf Gardens on Sunday for another regionally televised card. And even that couldn't go off without a major problem. When Bret Hart wrestled Horner earlier on that Saturday, obviously Horner sustained a worked injury, but Bret Hart suffered a very real injury when Dino Bravo sent him flying into the apron. The hitman crashed down chest first onto the steel guardrail, cracking five ribs, fracturing his sternum and bruising his heart. And yet somehow he was back in time to work Survivor Series just over three and a half weeks later. After a fraud and fragmented live event, the firing of an underneath wrestler and an injury being dealt to one of the company workhorses, Tully Blanchard, who had given his notice to the company sometime earlier, was fired that Wednesday following a drug test failure. Subsequently, his intended jump back to the NWA was scuppered when the organization withdrew their offer. All of this in a very fun five day stretch.
And bear in mind, this was the same month in which Coco Beware and company executive Jim Troy were fired following a physical altercation on a European tour. The same tour in which the Rockers were nearly fired for destroying hotel chandeliers in a fit of alcohol-fueled anger. Now, little of this is related to the sheer calamity of that live event in Springfield, Mass. But it's a fascinating look at the chaotic world of WWF during one of its most wildly popular eras. The WWF did return to Springfield that December for another Saturday matinee card. But this one went off without a hitch and featured the likes of Dusty Rhodes versus the Big Boss Man, Greg Valentine versus Ronnie Garvin, and world champion Hulk Hogan versus Mr. Perfect. An estimated 5,800 fans flocked to the mid-sized venue, so apparently there were very few hard feelings from that previous October show. Mostly, the October 1989 house show is lost to history, a forgettable hiccup in the grand run of the sports entertainment giant. But the story of what happened is a curious one, a look at the wearying travel of the stars of pro wrestling's top organization and what they do in the face of an unenviable situation. It may be forgotten law, but it's interesting law nonetheless.